Today we're going to go into uh, the double crested cormorant colony and when we're in there um, I have nests that I've been following ever since April so we're going to check in on those nests and there may be occasional fish falling from the sky and those are cormorants vomiting up fish that get really stressed out when you're in the colony and so I collect those fish and then um, identify them for species every year so I get ten, about 10 samples a week to do that. So we're going to go into the colony. I've got these maps that I've mapped the tree in April. And, um, and every week I then note the status of the nests in, this partic in these five trees that I'm following. So this allows me over a period of the, of the breeding season to figure out who's successful and who's not. Cormorants are really good parents in that they're, they, it takes two individuals, two, two adults to rear chicks. Um, and these chicks, when they get adult size, they're really, they're demanding. They're, they want to eat, they need to grow um, so they can fly away from this nest. But in most days that I'm out here, there's always an adult associated that's at that nest um, watching over these chicks. Um, so on days when it's hot out, that adult might um, go to the water and bring back water. The chicks have a specific call that they give to the adults that they want water. Um, and so it's important that an adult remain at the nest um, at all times. A natural process that undergoes when double crested cormorants start nesting in trees is they end up killing the trees over a period of about five years. And that's through a, a variety of processes. They acidify the soil, they, they poop on the leaves, which produces photosynthesis. And so it's this combination of, of factors that ends up killing the trees. And so, but they're still continually nesting in them. So the nest that I was following um, this year I lost quite a few because limbs falling, such as this limb right here. So uh, this can happen during any time during the nesting season and this is why I'm wearing a hard hat because um, a bird can just land on a tree limb of a dead tree and that limb can fall. And so uh, if uh, a limb goes out with, uh, with active nests, then you end up with a lot of um, dead and dying chicks on the ground. And at that point, um, I believe that the, that the adults won't take care of the chicks. But often they get injured when they, when they come down and they will end up dying of their injuries. This is, this is a very typical water bird colony. There's a lot of death along with a lot of new life in this area. These live birds end up being food for coyotes and raccoons, possums, maybe even skunks that are down here. Um, this is a peninsula, it's very unusual for colonial water birds to be nesting in areas where there are mammals. Um, but in this case, these are a, a good source of food for, uh, for those types of animals. So when most people look at a cormorant colony and they see these dying trees, they think um, that it's all a negative thing. But there are other species that are actually benefiting from the presence of this cormorant colony. And that's primarily ring-billed gulls. And the other one is black crow night herons. And on the ground, they have more interactions with gulls. And then in the trees, sometimes cormorants and black crow night herons um, argue over a nest and usually the cormorant wins because it's bigger. But the black crow night herons benefit by nesting um, from next to a cormorant colony and that they're in, they're in here um, feeding off of the fish that the cormorants are losing and feeding that to their chicks. And then I've also got an image this year of a black crow night heron eating a small um, cormorant chick. Toronto Regional Conservation Authority right. follows um, 
the trees and the tree health, so they have every tree that has an individual identifiable tag, and they GPS, they geolocate that tree, and so then they are able to follow the effect of the cormorants on the tree health. I think the role that this colony plays for an urban setting is it allows people to see ecology in action. It is a wilderness area, it's not just a park. So the wilderness area designation means that people can't bring their dogs here and that, that there's conservation zones for these nesting colonial water birds. What's the future of Tommy Thompson Park? I mean, I think one of the interesting things about ecology is that some of these things are hard to predict. And certainly the effect, the long-term effect of cormorant colonies has not been well studied. So we know that the immediate effect is that they kill trees, but we don't really know what happens past that. One of the unknowns is um, that I'm trying to sort out is how cormorants are impacting this invasive fire ant that's at the park and very large in certain, certain parts of the park in extremely large numbers. The cormorant colony is actually controlling um, and negatively impacting these invasive stinging European fire ants. And so most people would think that's a positive thing, but they don't see that from just the tree mortality. I think that the Toronto Region Conservation Authority is doing a really good job of um, humanely managing um, these, uh, these cormorants, and I think they will continue to do that. And so um, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. While you've seen me in the colonies doing work, in the cormorant and black crow night heron colonies, um, this work does create some disturbance and we try and minimize it at all costs, where we act the same way and try and get the birds habituated to the, to the workers. Um, but it's important that the public recognize that uh, going into the colonies while they're breeding does cause a great amount of disturbance and um, it's important that the public stay out of the colonies when the birds are nesting.